Yes, it's already happening. The gates of Nintendo's guarded kingdom are starting to collapse. If you're not aware, the Switch has been out for like 24 hours, maybe 48 hours at the time of this recording, and a gentleman named David Buchanan over on Blue Sky has landed a user land ROP chain on the first day of its existence, and through this ROP chain, he's able to arbitrarily write to the frame buffer of the Switch 2, allowing him to render this little graphic here on the Switch 2. I wanna talk about what this means, how this affects kind of the security of the Switch 2 and what additionally is required to get to a full jailbreak because unfortunately this ain't it. Now if you're new here, hi, my name is Low Level. This is a channel where I talk about cybersecurity, software security, a bunch of other cool stuff. So if you like that or just want to hang out, hit that sub button. Okay, this all starts about a couple weeks ago where reports are coming out that hackers had gotten access to early releases of the Switch 2 and it supposedly was unhackable. The reason for it being unhackable was that the MIG Switch, basically a mod chip from the previous Switch, was put into the Switch 2, causing it to boot loop. That's not super suspicious because like it's an old hack for a new device. They probably have signatures written for it. And the second one being, if you touch the flash storage of the ROM chip, which is required to extract firmware from a device you want to hack, if you did this, the Switch could detect it and turn it into a brick. Now, unless an exploit is found, it doesn't result into a brick. We're going to have a lot, it's going to be very hard to exploit the Switch, right? And so this caused a lot of people to regard the Switch as unhackable, saying hackers are reporting that they are having a hard time hacking the Switch 2. There's also a lot of speculation that all of these reports are just Nintendo putting up propaganda to be like, hey, don't, don't touch our flash storage, please. One thing that I think could be happening here is there's ways to prevent these things called fault injection attacks. A fault injection attack is this idea in software security where basically there is a chip that is doing some kind of compute and you inject a problem into it, right? You do it either through a power injection, a laser injection, an EMF injection, or you literally just like stab it with a fork. The whole point of this process here, I wrote in some very, uh, very high level garbage pseudocode. If you can't program, that's fine. I can explain it really quick. You're trying to confirm that the firmware is written by the manufacturer, right? You wanna make sure that only Nintendo code can run on this device. And effectively, you have this function that says, did Nintendo write the firmware, okay? And the way that did Nintendo write the firmware works is they compute the signature of the firmware and they compare the signature to a known good or verify that the signature came from Nintendo. And if it's not good, we return false. But if it is good, we return true. Pretty straightforward, right? Not that complicated. Well, what if we could cause the CPU to skip this return false? How would we do that? Well, what if we shot the Nintendo Switch 2 with literally a laser and cause the CPU to freak out and not run this instruction, okay? That would cause any signature to pass, bypassing secure boot. If you do wanna to learn to program, I have a great idea for you, the sponsor of today's video, me. Hi. It's me. Guys, I honestly believe that if you're a programmer trying to write fast, effective code, or you're a cybersecurity professional trying to stop your stuff from getting attacked, all of these require you to know the basic fundamentals of computers. My courses on the Level Academy teach you languages like C, networking in C, threading in C, assembly, and even a new installment, Rust, to learn the basics of how computers work. And Zero to Hero C programming will teach you the basics of the C programming language, the language that runs all other languages, and you can even learn arrays in C right now now for free, go check that lesson out. If you wanna learn assembly, my arm load operations lesson is also free. And I also have a free three-day C course that you can check out right here on the landing page. Guys, if you want to be a good programmer, you gotta know the fundamentals. And where do you learn the fundamentals? On Low Level Academy. All right, guys, back to the video. See you there. Obviously, the world of fault injection is much more complicated than that. I'm largely trivializing the process, but this is the whole idea. So this protection on the Switch 2, where basically the, the chip can detect that it's being fault injected, like this is a more common mitigation that's coming out in software because like fault injection to bypass secure boot is a common occurrence now uh, for hackers that are trying to get hacks going like this on the Switch 2. And so this may be happening, but regardless of that, David Buchanan managed to land a user land ROP. Okay, now there's a lot of words here that are kind of complicated, very hackery, but I'll explain what user land ROP is. In the world of hacking for a long time, when you executed this thing called a buffer overflow, you'd be able to take control of the return address of a function and point it anywhere, right? You can take control of the code. This is how all hackers did stuff for a long time. Eventually, CPU manufacturers were like, hmm, maybe we shouldn't allow them to do that. So what they did is they made this thing called NX, non-executable stacks, where basically you were no longer able to treat data provided by a user as code, right? It was either writable 
or executable, but it was never both. And so the idea of putting shell code into a program that a hacker could just arbitrarily execute was no longer possible. So then hackers decided, okay, hmm, if we can't write our own code, why don't we just use the code that's already in the program and use that to write our own programs? Hence a ROP chain. The ROP chain, which again is what David is using here to run this frame buffer example, a ROP chain is this really, really neat concept in, in exploitation where basically whenever a function returns, right, you have this little instruction here called a ret. The ret is literally just going to pull the next instruction from the return address off the stack. So it's going to do something by popping it off the stack. Now, if we can control where this return address goes, and there are other pop something gadgets like pop X or pop RDI, pop RSI, ret, and then do something, do something, ret, we're able to use these ROP chains, which are basically just pieces of code that have no side effects and end in a return to write our own program, right? We literally can use these little gadgets to say, uh, move this over here, move this over here, pop ret, or uh, do a syscall and then ret. So instead of using our own shell code, which is how computers used to do it back in the day, now we just write code by using the address of chains that already exist in the program. We don't have to write new code, we just have to put the address of code that already exists to make the functionality occur in our program. And so this is exactly what David is doing here. Again, the nature of what he's exploiting, like how he's getting the buffer overflow, nobody knows yet, but he's doing this ROP chain to write data to a frame buffer and then drawing this little green line going around on the screen, right? So what does this mean for the Switch 2? Is the Switch 2 hacked? No, it's not. David Buchanan is very explicit, very like outspoken about this in his tweet, where he says, hey, this is user land ROP. A lot of work needs to be done to actually turn this into a jailbreak. What's happening here is a hack in the user space of a process. So if you're not familiar with how computers work, generally the segmentation of computing is broken into two main domains. You have the user land and the kernel. So this means right now that he has code execution in this spot, right? But you can't do anything that violates the integrity of the operating system in a user land process. Typically when there are jailbreaks for OSs or jailbreaks for systems, there is a vulnerability in the kernel of the system which completely breaks the integrity of it, allowing you to replace components and effectively write your own OS for that platform, right? But what makes this even more complicated, uh, for a long time, devices did not use this thing called trust zone architecture, right? This is a new thing, new-ish, uh, that ARM has come out with, where we now not only have the segmentation of the user and the kernels. So think of the user being like the browser that you're watching this video on, like Chrome, Brave, Firefox, etc., and then the kernel being Windows, for example, right? Okay, but now in the ARM context, we have this whole other thing called the trust zone, right? The secure world. So ARM, the uh, CPU architecture, has a lot of really interesting technology as it applies to confidential computing, basically making it so that multiple instances of different code and the code has varying sensitivities can coexist without interacting or without compromising each other, right? So right now, he has likely an exploit in the, this is called the normal world. So literally, literally they are called worlds, right? They're, this is the normal world, and this is the secure world. Again, this is like pretty crazy stuff. He has a exploit that gives him control of uh, code control via ROP in the normal user world. So to completely violate this system, he will not only need an exploit that allows him to traverse into the kernel, he will likely also need to find a bug either from the kernel or from like a user space process into a secure user space process that has some kind of gateway built and find a similar overflow vulnerability in the secure world that will allow him to compromise not only the normal stack, but the secure world, and then eventually compromise the secure kernel to have complete control over the entire thing. And even if this happens, it is entirely possible that there is a thing on the device called an HSM, a hardware security module, um, that is doing the cryptographic verification of the firmware. Obviously, a lot of work is left to be done, but I do wanted to say, I find it very funny that the Switch was reported as being like unhackable like a week or two ago, and then the Switch has been out for literally like 24, 48 hours since the release of this video, and somebody already has code execution in one of these domains, right? Obviously, a ton of work left to do to get a full usable jailbreak where you can run your own code on the device, but it just goes to show that if a device exists 
there are exploits for it, and dude, hackers are gonna find it, man. It's just crazy. Anyway, if you like this video, do me a favor, hit like, hit subscribe, and then go check out this other video that I think you will also enjoy. We'll see you over there. Goodbye, I love you. Sorry. <laughs>